doing this for me for the group and uh, it's not very often you get a chance to talk to a living legend a uh, northern soul a pioneer a northern soul and uh, I'd love to thank him for that um, I want to, to start off by asking Russ how the idea of the casino came up Right, going back to the um, great um, early days, uh, Ralph, and it's uh, great to have you here. Thanks very much indeed for asking me. Um, I was into Northern Soul with um, places like Blackpool, Mecca in the early 70s, and before that, the Cromwellian in Blackpool. And um, I always really, really liked Northern Soul, but um, I was uh, DJing and do, as, a, as a general DJ as well um, in the early 70s. And um, I got on at um, Wigan Rugby Club on a, um, a Wednesday uh, night and a Sunday afternoon. And I was looking at expanding it. So we just thought, well, tell you what, let's try Fridays. This was like early in 72. So we tried Fridays at Wigan Rugby Club, uh, making it all Northern Soul. And um, we soon filled the place. It held about 550 and people had started traveling from all over. I was very lucky because my uncle um, also had moved across to uh, America and he uh, worked as a rep. So if I could, uh, I used to ask him for certain records, he'd be calling into the record shops and things. So that was fantastic. Um, and then people started asking me, oh, can you get this record or get that record and everything. So I started um, buying and selling quite a few things as well. Then, um, we heard that the uh, the torch was going to be um, finishing and there wouldn't be any all-nighters on. So I thought, oh, yeah, it'd be good to do it here, but really it'd be good to have it in like a bigger place. And the only place I can really think of, but I haven't ever worked there, is uh, Wigan Casino. So I uh, wandered across and had a word with the, uh, the guy who uh, at least supplies Jerry Marshall and uh, luckily had a a young manager called Mike Walker, who also did a bit of DJing. So um, I told him about it and the idea, and um, Jerry sort of like looked at me and said, what, you, what are you doing all night? Eh? Are you stupid or something? I off your head, and Mike said, hang on, Jerry, you know, let's have a go at doing this. Yeah, I getting asked for a lot of the records that Russ is playing, you know. And um, so they had to think about it, and um, Jerry said, well, you know, we have a big rock night first till two o'clock, so um, I don't want to knock much of that. So he said, um, well, we'll knock it back to, uh, um, to one o'clock that, finished it at that one o'clock and start at two. So I said, right, okay then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try and have a go at that. When do you think you can, we can go on that? And so we got together and it was September 23rd, 1973 that, um, and Jerry said, well, you know, you'll have to uh, bring the disco equipment. You'll have to put um, any guest DJs on. You'll have to advertise it. And I said, well, that's what I was expecting to do anyway. Yeah, no problem. And um, I said, well, you know, well, let's have a look at um, going halves on the money. And he just sort of like leaked at me, you know, so I was deaf. Um, anyway, we did the very first one. We had 652 people in at 75p each. So I thought, flying, this is brilliant. You know, the um, average wage was about £20 a week and I'm getting half of 400 quid. It's brilliant, this, you know. So I couldn't wait to go in that Monday morning and I said, right, you must be made up then, Mr. Marshall. Well, not really. Well, what do you mean? He said, well, well, when they found out the rock night was finishing early, he said it was about 500 down on that. And... Um, so that's 550p admissions, and then those 500 would have also had about eight drinks each. I thought, blimey, I've got to be owing, owing him money here. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Marshall. So I said, well, okay, then we're not bothering it. Well, I'll tell you what, then, um, I'll give you 50 quid for doing it. So I thought, 50 quid, yeah, two and a half times the uh, average rate, why not? Didn't know whether it'd last one week, two week, one year, two year, whatever. So we, um, we uh, continued and uh, after a few weeks the uh, police were um, 
sort of coming around saying there's too many people outside. We, we opened the club up underneath the casino, the beach coma, at midnight for anybody coming early or arriving at midnight or anything. And they weren't too happy about it. So um, uh, Jerry brought it forward. And what we did was we put the Rock Knight in our oldies club, which is called Mr M's. And uh, we put probably the first ever under 18s night on uh, before the casino, which finished at 11 o'clock. So um, it was perfect then for us opening at 12 o'clock and it just got bigger, 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 more people coming. Um, the amount of records that was getting coming across from my contacts and everything was absolutely amazing. Um, and um, the reputation just grew and grew and obviously um, part and parcel of it was the fact that the, um, the, the dance floor and the venue was absolutely superb. And uh, when we'd be going a year, in fact, we um, opened up the Mr. M's at two o'clock in the, in the morning um, to give us that extra space because we were getting, the main place held about 3,000 and we were getting around three and a half thousand in. So we opened Mr. M's at two o'clock to give us a chance of getting four, four and a half thousand people in. So it's just absolutely brilliant. And then, um, it offered me Wednesdays and Fridays there like I was doing at the, rug at the rugby club so I didn't lose out on that so we did Northern Nights there. and then they offered me Mondays as well so it's Monday, Wednesday, Fridays and then once a month it was the Friday oldies so we're doing like um, generally four sessions or four and a half sessions a week pulling in between 12 and 14 thousand people a week through the doors it's more than Wigan Rugby Club was doing and um, it just became, it was like um, jumping on a galloping horse and hanging on the back of it, you know, it's just incredible. And then the next thing is we start um, um, looking around for records like Frankie Valley, the, uh, the Night and Ghost in My House that became chart records. So we became well known with the record companies and everything. But um, it was amazing and people traveling all over the country to the casino. Um, mainly I advertised through Blues and Soul and Frank Elson and Dave Godin used to uh, come along and everything so it's just it's, it's a dream come true and uh, it still is a dream come true really it's just brilliant. So what, what would you feel like when you in, in 78 when they announced that the billboard announced that the uh, casino was the nightclub? Staggered that it was voted the uh, the best club in the world. Um, I think we, we just beat Studio 54 because the guys from Studio 54 in New York phoned me up and said, um, how come do you think you've won this? You know, I said, well, just amazed. It's fantastic, but we've got so many people coming in. They said, well, um, uh, he said, we got the best sound system in, in, in the whole world in our place. I said, well, you know, I was just sort of like, okay. He said, our lighting show is incredible, you know. I said, well, ours isn't too bad. He said, what have you got? So we've got two blue UV lights. So you got a good sense of humour. I said, no, we've got two blue UV lights because when people uh, are up all night, they don't want to uh, have, uh, have lights uh, all over them. So really, they were, uh, Studio 54 was especially miffed. But um, it was wonderful to find out that, um, you know, a club and everything run and it was one of those things it run really for everybody who came and like I had a, a thing written on, on my deck for the guest DJs that I used to bring in every so often and, uh, and it on there said I understand if you empty the dance floor once um, but if you empty it twice in succession you're sacked because <laughs> People would come in, they'd ask for requests and things, and it happens a lot these days, and uh, is, I just think it's ridiculous, really, that we had lots of new records then I wanted to play, but um, people came in to dance. So, okay, you play a new record, and, well, it might, you know, records like Time Will Pass You By were difficult to, to play then because the, the, the tempo was, was a bit lower. Um, so you might not do too well so you play two or three classics after that and then go back into it and everything but um, yeah everybody paid the thing was that everybody who came in paid our wages and etc and that was what was known um, 
But the atmosphere, the hand clapping, <laughs> things like Tainted Love and Go See In My Eyes were just absolutely uh, wonderful. And it was just, um, it was just like um, starting our own great, well, brand new type of, of, of venture, but with, with people coming in who all felt so much part of it, which you still do these days, which is great. It's, I found that uh, the, the, the love for the casino is amazing. Mm. I mean, it's, it is literally a legend, mm. uh, that place, it's, it's wonderful. Talking about legends, you had at the casino people like Edwin Starr, Jackie Wilson. What, what was that like to, to see these people? Oh, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, we um, were always looking for acts that were touring at the time. And um, yeah, there's quite a, a number of them, like Martha Reeves, Marvelettes, Elgins. Um, uh, Billy Butler, um, Ardeen Taylor we had on as well. I always remember when I booked Ardeen Taylor and uh, I was in my me, me shop, my me record shop on a Saturday afternoon and Jerry Marshall phoned me, hey Russ, Ardeen Taylor's here but they sent the wrong guy. I said, well, sorry Jerry, what do you think? So he's white. I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, he's a white guy actually. Said, oh, well, okay then, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, getting friendly, especially with people like Martha Rees and Edwin Starr was just, I worked with Edwin over 50 times. It was absolutely wonderful. And each time he came, because he'd done so many things, he said, hey, guess what, Edwin, you know, we found another record um, that you did that you, you, you wouldn't be aware of that were, is popular. Why would it? Oh, in 1976 it was. And, oh, we've got this one called Time. Oh, you're playing Time. Great, we'll get the guys and get rehearsing it and everything, you know. And then another time he came across, he said, um, oh, I got, he used to bring a different backing group when he could. So I've got this other backing group and um, there's a, a girl called Gwen who's, uh, who's a fantastic singer. Just have a listen to what she does and everything. He said, and uh, they've got uh, a record coming out when they get back as well, you know. He said, uh, but they've got a funny name. I don't know whether they do anything. They call Rolls Royce. All right, Edwin, yeah, that would be good, you know. But Edwin was just the professional. And um, what an entertainer. I just loved him to bits. And when he passed away, well, he came living over here in, in, in Nottingham in um, the late 90s. And then when we lost him in 2003, it was just absolutely heartbreaking because none of us uh, realised anything like that. But then I saw another guy who I never ever thought we'd get a chance of having on was um, the one and only Jackie Wilson. And um, our monies were, were, were pretty good, you know. We, uh, Jerry had said, go on, we can spend up to two and a half thousand pounds, which you could get most of the the acts, not the massive ones like your Marvin Gaze or Diana Rossi's, but most of the acts for that price. And I was scared of asking how much Jackie was, and he was seven thousand pounds. Then I found out that he was doing um, a club in Manchester one Saturday night at eleven o'clock. So I got in touch and said, well, why doesn't he come across and do half three? Because that was the time we had them on at the all-nighter. And um, he said, yeah, fine. I said, well, you know, you do, so, you know we'll, we do it for three and a half. So I said, yeah, go on. So we got in for three and a half days and he was absolutely incredible. He was superb. But yeah, then, you know, you've got the other people like Betty Wright, who you didn't think would be that good, who were absolutely stunning. You know, but um, Junie Walker was always fantastic and we had some uh, fantastic uh, acts and, you know, you got to know one guy I was always hunting for was Dean Parrish and um, could never find this uh, black guy, uh, whatever. And then I found him in like 2003 and there's a, a white Italian guy called Philippe Anastasi and, um, he, you know, he's a great friend now. And then... I spotted a guy I'd never seen before in a, a, a nightclub in uh, in the Bolton area called Tommy Hunt and was knocked out by him and chatting and said, oh, I used to be in the Flamingos and I told him about the casino and I said, oh, we've got a guy called Major Lance on it. Oh, no, Major. I said, right, come across, you know. So um, he saw Major and uh, Major was knocked out by seeing him because he'd come living over here, Tommy. And um, 
we did some records together and had quite a bit of success. But yeah, again, it's like the people and everything, the acts and everything, they're just absolutely wonderful. The only th unfortunate thing now we can't do anything about it, and it's the same with ourselves, is we're all getting older and older, so for goodness sake, get along, see everybody now, because in a few years' time, there won't be many around. It's great to have found, I was going through some um, uh, YouTube shots and I saw Jackie Wilson's son, Bobby Brooks Wilson. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll see how he feels about this and spoke to him and said, can you do some of the rarer ones of your father's? Yeah, okay then. And he just absolutely brought the house down at, um, at Skegness. So that's why I brought him over again and he's absolutely wonderful. And to find somebody like him, there's another British guy called Richie Sampson, a black guy who we've brought in as well. He's fantastic as well. Um, um, it's just that uh, there's other people like, um, well, Edwin Starr's brother, Angelo Starr, is uh, absolutely wonderful as well. And we have them on regularly. And then the young lads, um, Johnny Boy and Paul uh, um, Stuart Davis, etc., are, are great. And Signatures and Stefan. You know, we've got some great people who you know are going to be great. And then yeah. popping someone in um, that, you know, uh, you expect should be pretty good as well. But trying to find the ones who haven't been around or who are still available, I must say, is. is uh, a little bit more difficult but we've got uh, money to persuade Gloria Jones to come in from uh, Africa this year to Skegness so that's brilliant. Wonderful. Can you tell me the history bit behind the three before three before eight? What's three before eight yeah the last three records that I played before eight o'clock um, and um, I was always looking at using some sort of like new identity and everything and I came across a record when I was at the rugby club in 72 called them on my way which instead of it being a slow record and slowing things down it um, it made you sing your heart out and saying you know I've been to the lights of the city and everything it's been incredible and now I'm on my way and sort of like leaving and everything and um, it became very very big so obviously when i started the casino i wanted a, f a record to finish off with so i used them on my way and then <clears throat> 1973 74 i'd find time will pass you by uh, toby legend and i was struggling to um to break this record because the tempo was a little bit slower than normal so um, on the second year, I put it just behind, um, I'm on my way, and said, right, the last two records are now, time will pass you by and I'm on my way. And that helped break that. And then a few people are saying, oh, we don't hear long after tonight is all over very often these days, which is obviously a record that always used to be played at the end of the Twisted Wheel. And um, um, I brought that one in as well as just like a lead into it. And uh, it helped a lot from the DJ side of things as well, because um, virtually every club you go to, and you, uh, you, you're looking, oh, what time do we have to finish? Oh, eight o'clock. Well, I'll put then somebody, hey, can you not play such and such? You know, and you knew that they were irregular if you were playing something like Long After Tonight Time Pass You By, and people were still asking you for requests. So it worked for finishing at eight o'clock, you know, which you never wanted to do anyway. But uh, it had its, its great things about it, yeah. So that's how the, the last three happened and became identifiable with myself and Wing Casino. 